You be seated. I've been doing a lot of talking about giving thanks this past past couple weeks. But this year I've also spent a lot of time thinking about family traditions on Thanksgiving Day. Some of the traditions that have been shared with me are um, gathering the whole family together, watching football, playing card games with the family, uh, some even running from house to house so no one in the family seems uh, is left out. Sharing what we're thankful for around the table and, of course, eating. This is one of my favorite traditions. Everyone eats. No matter what other traditions there are, everyone seems to eat. And we eat way too much and we eat way too long on Thanksgiving. And after that eating, many also take some time and nap. But whether you do or not, everyone eats. And a few years back, my family decided that uh, we would decide, we decided to spend Thanksgiving Day serving those less fortunate than us. But we still ate. Because the next day, Friday, we would take the kids to our favorite restaurant and we would have our feast. And there's some benefits to doing it this way. No fuss. No muss. Nobody standing over a stove for hours. Nobody stirring, stirring a pot. No dishes to wash afterwards. Everything was done and on the table at the same time, and everyone got to eat what they wanted. So we didn't have to worry about making five different meals to make sure everybody was happy. And no football. And we loved it. Now, as I listened to and pondered the different traditions I heard, I started to think, if we were Christians, if we are Christians, should it show? I mean, should people be able to tell just by looking at us or by watching us that we are followers of Christ? And not because we wear a t-shirt that says, I'm a Christian, and not because of wearing a cross or some other thing, but by how we act and talk and live, should they be able to tell that we are Christians? So, putting that question aside for a minute, I want to focus on the thankful part of all of this because we are in the Thanksgiving season. Because you see, today we gather here as a community of gratitude. We gather with grateful hearts to explore God's profound message. We gather to give thanks. Now, a profound message about giving thanks in all circumstances and reminding us that a heart of gratitude can transform our lives. That's a profound message. And this profound message is found in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. So turn to Philippians chapter 4 and look at verses 4 to 13. It's on page 1,675 in your pew Bibles. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 13, page 1675. We're going to read it responsively. I'll read the first verse. You read the next one. And we'll, bu we'll bounce back and forth until we reach verse 13. So it's, we're starting with verse 4, chapter 4 of Philippians on page 1675. These are Paul's final exhortations. And verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Read verse 5. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Verse 7, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Read verse 9. Whatever. 
Paul then goes on to thank them for their gifts. Verse 10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Read verse 11. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13. Let's pray. God, thank you for listening to us whenever we are afraid. Help us remember all the good things that you've done for us. God, please fill our hearts and our mind with your peace. Holy Spirit, come down. Show us the joy in our lives and the reasons to be joyful. Amen. So, Paul begins by urging us to rejoice always. And in a world filled with challenges and uncertainties, this command might seem difficult to follow. But here's the thing. Paul's not suggesting that we should only rejoice when circumstances align with our desires. Instead, he invites us to find our joy in the unchanging character of the Lord. You see, Paul's not asking us to pretend that everything's perfect. No. He's encouraging us to find joy in the Lord regardless of our circumstances. Because when we turn our hearts to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we invite His peace to guard our hearts and our minds. Now Paul continues by urging us to let our gentleness be evident to all. In a world that often values assertiveness and self-promotion, gentleness Well, that can be misconstrued as weakness. But the gentleness that Paul speaks of, it's a strength born out of humility and trust in God. Our interactions with others should reflect the gentleness of Christ, reminding us that we are all recipients of God's grace. So as we navigate through life's challenges, our demeanor can be a powerful testimony to the transforming work of God's love in our hearts. So Paul also acknowledges the reality of anxiety in our lives, but he provides a powerful solution, prayer. Instead of allowing worry to consume us, he encourages us to bring our concerns to God through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And the promise that follows is profound. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In a world marked by stress and uncertainty, the peace of God stands as a beacon of hope. By entrusting our cares to Him, we can experience a peace that surpasses human understanding, a peace that guards our hearts and our minds. Now in verses 8 and 9, Paul directs our attention to the power of our thoughts. Because by fixing our minds on whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy, we cultivate a mindset of gratitude. You see, our contentment isn't found in our external circumstances, but in the way that we perceive and respond to those circumstances. Paul then shares a powerful testimony about learning the secret of contentment. Whether in times of abundance or lack, Paul discovered that he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him. And this profound realization goes beyond mere self-sufficiency. It points to the transformative power of Christ in every aspect of our lives. When we place our trust in Him, we find the strength to give thanks in all circumstances. So in our journey of gratitude, let's remember that our ability to give thanks in everything is not dependent on our circumstances, but on our connection to the one who strengthens us. It is through Christ that we can face challenges with confidence, knowing that His grace is sufficient for us. Okay, so back to the question. If we are Christians, should it show? Now, our faith I'm talking about, 
Should anyone be able to look at us and know that we are followers of Jesus? And you know, on the one hand, this question is nonsense. I mean, only God can see into the heart to know what's true and what's an act. And that's why Jesus warns us over and over again to not be so judgmental. We're so quick to decide who's in and who's out, and we often make mistakes because we don't have the vision of God. We don't know what core beliefs or defining experiences have shaped this person we're judging. So the judging is better left to God. So let's leave that to Him. But on the other hand, we all know that our faith isn't just a head thing. It isn't just a set of beliefs that we hold to be true. Faith is a way of living, a way of being in the world. And this means that our question isn't so nonsensical after all. Should it show? Yes, it should show. Our faith should be shown in what we do and say. It should be shown in the choices that we make and the priorities that we set. But I think there's more that should show because of our faith. Something more that should be in us and come out from us so that everyone around us sees that something. And that something is gratitude. We're supposed to be the ones who live thankfully, who live aware of what others have done and are doing for us. We're supposed to be the ones who know that God sacrificed His Son for us. And we should have the gratitude for that. And if we have that gratitude, we should be able to show and live that gratitude. We should be showing the gratitude. For instance, we should be thankful for Bill for taking the time to mow the lawn all summer long. Thank you. We should be thankful for Tina for taking it upon herself to keep the church clean and for Alice for helping her. Thank you. We should be thankful for Mike and Lori and all that they do for the service each week. Thank you. And for Carrie and all of those that are helping with the kids for picking up the the mantle of the Sunday school. Thank you. And for all of those in our church family who help to keep this church alive and vibrant. Thank you. Because without you, we're a building with people. But without you, we're not the family that we are. So thank you. You see, gratitude, gratitude is what should set us apart from the rest of the world as we live and move and have our being. Ours should be an exuberant gratitude that reflects our wonder at being alive in this interwoven world. And often we find that gratitude and joy are woven together in Paul's writing and that it's sometimes hard to tell one from the other, gratitude or joy. But either way, it shows us that our consideration of a life of gratitude should be exuberant and it should be marked by the joy of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that gratitude, that joy, it should be evident for everyone. No, it should be evident for anyone to see. Should our faith show? Yes, it should show. It should show in our joy and our thanks. It should show in our gratitude towards each other. It should show. Friends, may our hearts be filled with gratitude. So rejoice in the Lord always and let your gentleness be evident. Be anxious for nothing and find strength in Christ who empowers us to navigate every season of life with contentment and thanksgiving. In everything, dear friends, let us give thanks. And let the joy in our lives shine so brightly that when people see it, they go, what do they have? What do they know? And I want to know it too. Because we have the joy of knowing that our God loves us. And that Christ has sacrificed himself for us to give us a relationship with the Father. Let us give thanks. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for your many blessings in our lives. We rejoice in you always, finding our joy in the Lord. We pray that your peace will surpass all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds as we bring our anxieties to you. 
In this Thanksgiving week, help us cultivate a spirit of thankfulness in our daily lives and express our gratitude, not only in words, but also in our actions. Let the world see your joy emanating from us so much that there's no question in their minds if we are your followers or not. We pray this in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, would the ushers come forward so that as joyful 